A fleet of replicas of Australia's iconic 18-footers of the first half of the 20th century race every summer Saturday on Sydney Harbour. Each boat is a replica of an original design from between 1906 and 1950. My boat is Britannia, an exact replica of the original built in 1919 by Wee Georgie Robinson, seen here under Big Rig on a light day. and here under a third rig in a fresh breeze. I built Britannia over 15 months in 2001 and 2002. Aussie open boats were generally built from a half hull model. I had the luxury of a full set of plans drawn from the original boat by Alan and David Payne for the National Maritime Museum. Either method still requires lofting or drawing the plans out full size. Flexible battens are bent around nails to mark fair curves. Patterns can be made from the lofting for structural parts such as the stem knee, the stern knee, and the tuck or transom. Flathead nails are placed on the lofted lines as a means of transferring the shapes to the moulds around which the hull planking will be bent. It's important to transfer all the grid lines as well. The pine mould stock is then carefully placed over the nails and pressure applied to imprint the nail heads on the underside of the timber. Using the imprints, the straight grid lines are drawn on the mould stock and marked for which line they represent. The curved lines to which we'll cut are marked with the batten bent around nails in the imprint holes. Every relevant line should be checked and labelled before you're finished with each piece. The marked board is attached to a blank board and cut out as a pair on the bandsaw. The parts are assembled on the loft floor and a horizontal cross ball is attached at a set height. Using measurements from the locking, the spotted gum peel is marked and then cut out. The underside of the keel is then marked out with nails and a flexible batten. The bevel angle of the bottom of the keel is cut and chiselled at each station. And the changing bevel is then fared in roughly with a power plane and finished with a hand plane. The rebate or rabbit for the planking is then cut, chiselled and planed. The keel is attached to the stem and stern knees and the tuck and the whole assembly is fitted onto the strong back and then the moulds are placed in position. The planking then begins with Australian cedar. The shape of some of the planks is determined by a method called spiling. A series of arcs is marked on a temporary batten and then transferred onto the plank stock by finding the origin of each of those arcs. In this case I'm actually marking the plank shape onto the bench as it was a curved plank that needed two lengths joined at an angle. And I needed to know how much territory the timber had to cover. Nails are tacked into these marks and the plank edge is drawn in around a flexible batten. For this curved plank, two lengths of cedar are joined with a stepped scarf joint, cut with hand saw and chisel. Roughed out with a power plane, and, as always, finished off with a hand plane. Once joined, the full length plank is then marked, cut, and its edge planed to fit the previous plank. The forward end is fitted carefully into the rabbit with a bit of judicious tapping to close up the gap. Each plank is clamped into place 
with its top batten loosely attached with temporary steel nails. The stem rabbit gets a bit of fine tuning. Planks near the curved area at the turn of the bilge need to be cut from thicker stock. With their outer side rounded over, and their inner side hollowed, particularly at the aft end where they land on the tuck. Not every plank needs to be spiled. Most are straight enough so that the stock can be clamped around and a set of compasses set to the greatest gap between the old and the new plank is used to scribe a line. This line is then cut to and then planed and it should be a close fit with a minor bit of adjustment. The plank is then drilled off and nailed to its top and bottom batten, leaving gaps where the ribs will be fitted later. With such light planking, every nail is backed up with a dolly when driven. Every nail through plank and batten is driven, and then a rove is placed over the point and driven down. The point is then nipped off and the nail is peened or riveted over the rove with multiple light blows from a small ball peen hammer. Then you do it about 4,000 more times. Green spotted gum ribs are heated in a steam box for at least half an hour to make them pliable. Then they're bent into the boat and clamped into place. There's a job for several people. The ribs are drilled and nailed. Some original builders drove the nails undrilled through the hot ribs, but most drilled for them. Some builders rove the rib nails as well, but most of them clench the nails, simply nipping them short and bending them over and flattening them while being backed up with a dolly. The internal structure of stringers, risers, fin case, forts and knees, deck beams and carlins are all fitted. Then the deck planking goes on. This is much simpler than the hull planking. You can simply lay the cedar plank stock on top and draw a line underneath it to get the shape. Before the deck is finally fitted, varnish is applied to the mating surfaces and everywhere else that will be hard to reach once the deck is on. Spar making is a big part of building an 18-footer. Good clear-grade Oregon pine, Douglas fir, 
is thickness to its maximum dimension in two halves and the required taper is marked on it with nails and batten. And the waist is cut off. The sides are planed back to the line and checked for fairness. The spars, in this case the gaff, are hollow, so a series of incremental cuts is made with a circular suit. The waste is chiselled out, and a router is sometimes used as well. The ends of the hollow sections are tapered. The hollow is then cleaned up with a round soled plane. and sealed with varnish or epoxy resin. The two halves are then glued up. Once the glue is dry, the taper in the other dimension is marked. Cut. And plane, starting with the power plane and finishing as always with the hand plane. It's important that the spar is square all the way along. And that it is fair, that is, with no bumps or hollows. And sighting from each end is the best way to check this. A simple spar gauge is used to mark all four sides with lines that represent the corners of an eight-sided spar. The hatched area between these lines is the timber that will be removed to make the spar eight-sided. The quickest and most pleasant way to remove this is using a draw knife. But as always, you will need to finish with a hand plane. Once it's eight-sided, you knock off those corners to make it 16-sided, then 32, then plane it round and sand it smooth. Launch day, October the 19th, 2002, was a big day at the Sydney Flying Squadron. The crew and other friends helped rig the new sails. And the Britannia was christened with the traditional champagne by Faye Magna, the daughter of Wee Georgie Robinson, the original builder. With a fresh southerly blowing, the crew rolled the boat across the park, down the ramp and into the water for the first time. We headed out to the start with the rest of the fleet. The breeze began to ease, but it was great to feel the boat moving after all those months of building. The original Britannia sailed on Sydney Harbour for 25 seasons from 1919 to 1944. As of 2017, the replica is up to 15 seasons. The ferry in the background has followed the fleet for decades. You can still climb aboard for a good close-up look at the historical Racing 18s any summer Saturday. It's one of the great sights of Sydney Harbour. Recently I put it all down in a book, The Open Boat, which goes into the history of where the 18s came from, how they evolved, and how they were built and how they were rigged. You can find out more on www.openboat.com.au